But where this is being practiced, you need to understand another principle I call supervision. You get people involved and they're going to make some mistakes. That's to be expected. In fact, there are going to be times of real discouragement. And you need to be there in those low moments or they be, may be tempted to give up. That's why it's important. When a person comes to Christ, you need to get back with them the next day. Never let 48 hours pass without having some contact. And if you can't personally be involved, then get a friend to be involved. Or at least get on the telephone and give them a call or an email. But they need to be in constant touch with someone who is like a shepherd. Hopefully someone that has similar interests, someone who can resonate with them in a friendly way that they can accept without any difficulty. But they must have that kind of personal attention. In addition to the other activities of the church. But don't expect the church to carry on the function of ministry which you personally can give to a few. And you'll need in this time of supervision to do what Jesus did. He made it a point to get back with the disciples, ask them how things were going, and he was using their experiences as they were going out into new villages as the starting point for further teaching. So that his theology, his great message of redemption doesn't sound like a lecture. When you read the four Gospels, it doesn't sound like a systematic theology. It sounds like someone has come alive and has walked right through your life. And the theology comes through so simply and so naturally that you are learning without even being aware you are having the greatest education of your life. Just take as an example the time now we're told 70 come back. It indicates there's been some growth in the number that have been working. They come back and they report to Jesus, even demons were subject to them. Obviously they've had some success and Jesus rejoices with the Spirit. Don't overlook anything in the Scripture. Every word is inspired. And it's all the more important since we have such a limited amount of Scripture that pertains to the actual ministry of Christ in the Gospels. Only about 50 days are recorded and only brief portions of those days. And that's why we need to be careful that we don't miss anything. It's all inspired by the Spirit. And you parents know how important it is to rejoice when your kids do something right. Don't you let them know you're proud of them. Give them a hug or a kiss. You take that little drawing they made in Sunday school and put it up on the refrigerator door. And everybody that comes in the house you call attention to what your child has done. It's so beautiful. You know, they need affirmation. And most of us could stand more affirmation than we get. But Jesus rejoiced with the disciples after their success. But he also used the occasion to teach a great theological truth. He said he could now see Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Remember? Now there are many ways to look at that. But among them is the idea that as this work continues, as it multiplies, the powers of darkness in this world will be shaken. Certainly it's an encouraging word. The name of Christ is superior to all the other assaults that come from this world. And He will win the last battle. 
But there's a practical lesson here that we dare not overlook. Jesus says, I'm happy for you today, but don't rejoice because demons are subject to you. Rather rejoice that your names are written in the book of heaven. Do you see the lesson? A very practical observation. Suppose these disciples had the idea that you rejoice only when everything goes your way. You went out, you worked hard, people were responsive, you were commended, and so you come back excited because you've done it so well. Well, that's good, but what would happen if you tried just as hard and no one seemed to respond? You could have been rejected. You could be even spit upon. And there are many in our world today that are suffering for their faith in difficult parts of the earth. They're being persecuted. And yet, there's no reason for us ever to feel like there's lack of joy in ministry. Because our priorities are not dependent upon how people respond and how they acknowledge our success or even how we see our failure. Our joy comes from Him who called us and who leads us in His way, whether it is pleasant or whether it is hard. Jesus, we're told, learned obedience through suffering. And if you're going through some struggles it's because God has a purpose in working through it for good to those who love God who are called according to His purpose. And you can be sure that as you go forth in the name of Christ, the assaults of the evil one in this world, the prince of this world, will challenge you. And the attack will be most direct when you bear witness to the gospel, because that's the way the kingdom of darkness is defeated. And if you're facing some hostility, if you're facing rejection, the probability is there's been some light come into darkness, and the powers of evil have not been pleased. They will challenge you. Evangelism is always a ministry against the forces of darkness in this world. But you don't ever take your joy from how the world treats you. Your joy comes from heaven. That's what Jesus is teaching the disciples. Regardless of the circumstances, you can rejoice. I try to tell this to my students. I want to hear some shouts of joy on this campus. We go to a ball game and get excited, don't we? Well, what would be wrong if expressing a little joy sometimes in the house of God? Now, I know it's not always our custom, but I come from the South where it's not uh, strange to give expression sometime to your joy. I expect the people in St. Louis were not restrained in their joy last night, <laughs> whereas my people down in Texas are not going to have a very pleasant sleep. But Whatever the circumstances, you can rejoice. That's what Jesus is teaching these disciples. It's not a sermon. It's an observation He made that very day after they had an experience. And it's in those times that we really see how God is teaching us. And to whom much is given, remember, much is required. And the further that we go on this journey, the more we can expect challenges to come from the evil one. And yet through it all, God is faithful. And those who trust Him, O oh Lord, will never lack His faithfulness. For He has never <laughs> forsaken those who seek it. It's a principle. 
a principle that we learn as we move along on this journey. So you have frequent times of review. You ask how they're coming along. I frequently ask someone to tell me how they're coming along in their quiet time, their time alone with God in prayer. For this is an index of how they're really in communion with God. If you are keeping your quiet time, as I call it, alone with God every day, fresh, the chances are you're having victory all along the lines. But if you're defeated in your time alone with God every day, the chances are you're also facing difficulties and defeat in other areas of your life. So I say, fella, how'd you get along in your prayer this week? Share something fresh the Lord has given you in your devotions this week. In my class that I meet with on Thursday, that's the way we begin every class. And I have to sometimes encourage them. Sometimes I'll have to call their name at least one or two because they're hesitant. But I want the class to realize this is important. This is more important than just reading the books. This is more important than coming to class. But it's important that you spend some time alone with God every day. It's not a question of time, really. You have time to read the newspaper. You have time to watch television. You're kidding me if you say you don't have time to pray. It's a matter of priority. We have time in this life for the things that to us are important. And if it's important to be in communion with God, then your quiet time with God every day is important. So you ask them how they're coming along. And you may have to say, well, have you done this? Have you done that? Maybe you need to Take a shower so you'll be awake. If you find yourself weary, why don't you take a walk? You can pray even while you're walking. Or maybe you need to sing one of the great old hymns of the church that's familiar that brings into your realization the presence of God. Work at it. Every one of us needs a time every day for prayer, and that's one of the crucial matters of discipleship and in the word too check up how they're coming along reading the bible i require my students to have at least 30 minutes every day in prayer and also to be reading the bible when i'm meeting with a group we will usually select a passage of the bible and we will read together that same passage i often use ian mclaren's little formula which has a couple of uh, or three chapters in the Bible through the whole sequence of a year. And that way when we come together we can talk about it, ask about it. Or it might be a book that you're reading. One of uh, C.S. Lewis' book. All oh, those are terrific books for discussion in a group. But just ask how they're coming along and the discipline that we have accepted. Of course you work on attitudes, you work on character traits, Maybe there's an unforgiving spirit. They've been hurt, and they just can't get over that hurdle. You've got to deal with it. If we've been forgiven by God, we must forgive those who we feel have wronged us. Maybe it's a spirit of enmity or bitterness or pride. Those old fleshly traits that reflect that fallen nature which still we have and must struggle with all through life. But whatever the problem, God's grace is sufficient. Isn't that beautiful? And the promise is if we walk in the light as He gives us light, that is as we continue to follow, as we continue to obey, we have continual fellowship. And the blood of Jesus Christ continually cleanses from all sin. You don't ever have to go to bed at night with a guilty conscience 
because there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit for the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Isn't that beautiful? This is a promise. And this is what you deal with when you're together as you continue to move on to something more. Be careful, though, that you also notice their, their strengths. Don't criticize as much as you affirm. Find something to brag on, and you don't have to be the authority. There's only one authority. You remember how the Great Commission, all authority belongs to Jesus, so keep the focus on Him. Let the Word speak, and together, as the body of Christ, brought providentially into this experience, you are growing in the likeness of Him who is continually leading you on to something more, something better, so that today will be better than yesterday. And tomorrow, all the anticipation thrills us with excitement. What a way to live in the obedience of the Great Commission. Father, we thank you for this happy fellowship and the privilege that you've given us all to learn. And so grateful we are that you don't reward us according to our iniquity, but according to your infinite mercy. And we're grateful. Oh, how grateful that you have such more to teach us that you are going to continue to lead us on to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're getting near the end of a, a long period together, and it gets better as you go along. It's the way life is. The best is yet to be. We're always looking forward to the day when finally our faith will turn to sight. We've been thinking about the instructions that Jesus gave His followers before He left. We call it the Great Commission. When the whole church was commissioned to go and in a real way replicate in their lives what they had seen in Jesus' life with them. and. We've been trying to trace how that developed, how in the midst of busy ministry to multitudes of people, he concentrated on a few who seemed to be in a close sense uh, being trained uh, to take over his work after he left. And they stayed together for the better part of three years in different relationships. They learned. Uh, obedience as they watched Christ as He suffered and as they too began to experience some suffering, though nothing like what they were yet to discover as they went out into the world. But they were prepared, for they had seen everything that Jesus taught, demonstrated in the lifestyle of their Lord. And as they were able, He found ways to involve them in His ministry, so they had a sense of being a part of His work, felt important, even as they continued to learn. And He kept check on them to see that they are coming along, building into them the, the sense of accountability. And that brings us now to that principle of reproduction or multiplication. Multiplication. 